that cometh, and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. That's an amazing verse right there. Try to wrap your brain around that one for a while. As a, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Father, bless the message. Use it for your honor and for your glory. I pray, Lord, that you would just kind of remove me out of the picture here. And Lord, I pray that as we bring this message, that you would be exalted and magnified and glorified today. Use this message, Lord, to speak to somebody's heart here, either today here in this place or online. Lord, we never know really what goes on out there as, uh, Lord, online or even in the future when somebody might click on to this message someday. Lord, I pray that you would use it to save a soul. Bless the message, encourage us Christians, and challenge us, Lord, uh, with it. And Lord, also save the lost, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Gaylord Kambarami, the general secretary of the Bible Society in Zimbabwe, tried to give a New Testament to a very belligerent and mean man. The man insisted that he would roll the pages and use them to make cigarettes. Mr. Kambarami said, I understand that, but at least promise to read the page of the New Testament before you smoke it. The man agreed, and the two went their separate ways. Fifteen years later, the two men met at a convention in Zimbabwe. The scripture-smoking pagan had been saved and was now a full-time evangelist. He told the audience this, and I quote, I smoked Matthew, and I smoked Mark, and I smoked Luke. But when I got to John 3.16, I couldn't smoke anymore. My life was changed from that moment. Aren't you glad that God's book is more than just words on a paper? John 3.16 is the most popular verse in the Bible. I think I am safe to say that. Most people would agree that John 3.16 is the most popular verse. John 3.16 has been translated into more than 1,100 languages. 27 of those languages are understood by about 20 27 of them are, are understood by about three-fourths of the entire population of the world. So most people can understand John 3.16. Martin Luther, the great reformer back in, uh, what, 14, 1500s, said that John 3.16 is the heart of the Bible. The heart of the Bible. A preacher by the name of Henry Morehouse has 600 outlines of this one verse. That's pretty amazing. I have three written in my Bible that I've outlined this verse, and I'm going to bring one of those messages here today. A missionary to Africa told a story of an elderly woman who was reached with the gospel. Though she was blind and could neither read nor write, she wanted to share her newfound faith with others. She went to the missionary and asked for a copy of the Bible in French. When she got it, she asked the missionary to underline John 3.16 in red and mark the page so that she could easily find it. The missionary wanted to see what she would do, so one day he followed her. In the afternoon, just before school left out, or let out, she made her way to the front door. And as the boys came out when the school was dismissed, she would stop one and ask if he knew how to read French. 
When he said yes, she would ask him to read the verse that was marked in red, John 3.16. Then she would ask, do you know what that means? And she would tell that person about Jesus Christ. The missionary said that 24 of the school boys that that lady had led to the Lord became pastors because of John 3.16. If I was to ask many of you here in this room today if John 3.16 is one of your favorite verses, I would probably get a number of hands that would be raised. If I asked many of you to quote the verse, I'm sure that some of you could quickly just quote the verse because you've memorized it over the years. John 3.16 was the very first verse that I ever memorized as a child. Is John 3.16. It was taught to us in vacation Bible school when I was just a little tyke, being a pest to my parents and my brothers that were younger than me. Right, Buck? <laughs> but John 3.16 was memorized and placed in my heart as a child. And you know, I never forgot it. It's still a favorite verse of mine. John 3.16, it says again, and I'll say it. Let's all read it together. Some of you know it by heart, but let's, if you don't, look at your Bible, and let's just say it together. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. I want to give you four things today about this verse and how special this verse is. I'm sure that you would agree that by reading this verse, an individual could get saved. I believe that. I believe that really anybody could take any verse from the Bible and could be saved from it. Because the Word of God promises, and God promises that when the Word of God goes out, it never returns void. God can take a scripture from 1 Chronicles with all those names, and in the fourth chapter, all of a sudden you come across the prayer of Jabez, and you can see an amazing message there. So God could take any passage of Scripture, any verse, and use it with the Holy Spirit working in that heart, bring somebody to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I believe that with all my heart. And I believe that John 3.16 is one of the greatest verses in all the Bible, that again, it says some things. It gives four things here. Let me give you that. Number one, the degree of love that we find here in those first few words when it says, For God so loved the world. That little word so, two letters, S and O, refers to the degree of love. It doesn't say, For God loved the world, and just goes on. God, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, when John wrote this, he wrote that word so in there to express how much love he has. For God so loved the world that he gave. And we'll get into that. So Webster says this about that little word so. It means to a great extent. So I want you to think about that here today as we're looking at this. For God so loved the world. Now, who makes up the world? Every human being does. You and I make up the world. Does this verse, does that little phrase mean that God so loves you? Yes, yes, God so loves you. Stephen Barr, Steve, do you so love your wife? You just love her. Ah, yeah, she's okay. Yeah. You so love her. Barb, you so love him. You see that kiss that he planted on her? I mean... It kind of, kind of tells you something right there. He so loves her. To keep two people together for 30 years or 50 years, we have some 50-year people in, in here, 50-year couples. We have some 40-year couples maybe, 30, 20, 10. There's got to be that love that means so much. This really is a love that goes way above us humans. When I think about the love that God has for me and for this world, I, I have a hard time. God, help me to try to understand it a little bit. But I can't really understand the love that God has for the entire world. I love my wife dearly. We've been married for a little over 50 years. And if I didn't love her, I wouldn't stick with her. And if she didn't love me, she wouldn't stick with me. And it's amazed me over the years that she's hung with me all these years. 
But the Bible says, for God so loved the world. This is a love that God has for mankind. When I think about all of the sins that I've committed in my life, I'm 70 years old, and so I've committed a few sins. And I don't think I'm alone in this room. I think there's probably a whole bunch of sin in this room because a whole bunch of us have been around for a while. I probably think that at least every day somebody sins against God of the people in this room. You might even sin every day. You might even sin and you don't even realize you sinned. Some people sin and they don't realize they sin. But we do. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means you and me. But this love that God has, how can God love a bunch of humans? How can God love a bunch of people that nailed Him to a cross? You ever thought about that? They nailed Him to the cross. They, they tortured Him. They pulled His beard out. They, they put a crown of thorns on His head. They beat Him with a cat of nine tails. He was literally unrecognizable, and he's still hanging there. Instead of pleading for his life, he's saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know what that little phrase, the first thing that he said on the cross, Father, forgive them, shows his love. And he was speaking not just to the crowd that was around him, but he was looking 2,000 years ahead of time, looking right at you. Amen. You and I were in that crowd. In the mind of Christ, we were in the crowd. In the mind of Christ, you were standing there at the foot of the cross, yelling and screaming and, and, and cursing Him out, and don't sit there and say you weren't. In His mind, He saw you. In His mind, He saw me. How did He do that? Only God could have done something like that. To look down through the, the annals of time and be able to see me and see you and still love me enough and love you enough that he died for you. <laughs> that just kind of, it just, it's, it's amazing. Romans 5, 8 says, but God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Well, again, what does that mean? It almost puts it into present tense, doesn't it? For God so loved the world that He gave His... For God, I'm sorry. But God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So as He's hanging there on the cross, He's dying for you and me. He wasn't just dying for the crowd that was around Him or for the Roman soldiers or the Pharisees that nailed or had Him killed. He was dying for you and me. And He, had, he knows your name and He knows my name. And he knows, I, I think He knows my face and knew my face. And, and when He's hanging there dying, He saw me and saw you in that crowd. I know you weren't there physically. I know that you weren't really there. That's 2,000 years ago but he still saw you. He had you on his mind while he was hanging on the cross. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren, the verse says. But that first part of that verse is, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. Look at Titus chapter 3. Find Titus chapter 3. Look at verse 3. Titus 3.3. 3. The degree of love that we see in John 3.16 and the degree of love that we see that Jesus had for us um, the only thing that I can say is mind-boggling. Titus 3.3, 3, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish. Would you say amen to that? Yeah. Disobedient. Yeah. Say amen. amen. Deceived. Yeah. Serving diverse lusts and pleasures. Say amen. amen. Living in malice and envy. Amen. Hateful yeah. and hating one another. There's a description of the world today. 
But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. 1 John chapter 4. Look at 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7. How much love did the Lord have for you 2,000 years ago? Enough love to die for you. The Bible, while you're turning there, the Bible tells us in John, was it 15, 13? Greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends? Not only was Christ viewing you 2,000 years ago, He was looking at you as a friend. What kind of a friend have you been to Jesus Christ? 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Beloved, let us love one another. Why? For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation simply means a satisfaction. It's to satisfy God's righteous anger towards sin, and that was in His Son. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to, to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and His love is perfected in us. Verse 17, herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he what? First loved us. The degree of love that we have is just, the degree of love, I should say, that God had for us just kind of blows our mind. The only way that we can understand it is by Picturing Jesus Christ dying for us. Never complained when he was being beaten. Never begged for mercy when he was being beaten. Never asked for somebody to take his place. Remember, uh, Barabbas was the guy that was supposed to be on that cross. Jesus took his place. Which represents the taking of our place. Barabbas is a picture of the lost sinner... Dying on the cross, should have been dying on the cross. You and I should have been there ourselves. But Jesus stepped in and took Barabbas' place. Barabbas went free. Some people think maybe he got saved as a result of that whole thing. I have no idea. I don't know. We'll know when we get to heaven if Barabbas will be, will be there or not. The guy's got to be pretty crazy not to recognize what Jesus did for him and not believe but the degree of love is just amazing. Number two, the second thing we see is in John 3.16, uh, that little passage or portion of Scripture that says that He gave His only begotten Son. There's the demonstration of love. The demonstration of love. That He gave His only begotten Son. The word begotten means virgin born. That's pretty much what that word means. It means the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. He gave. God did something to prove to the world that He loves the world so much, He proved that love by giving something. It was a gift. And He gave His only begotten, His only Son, to die for the world. That proves the love that God had. When you give a sacrifice, when you, when you do a sacrifice, or whatever the case may be, you are proving your love for somebody. 
When a husband sacrificed for his wife and vice versa, that shows and proves the love that they have for one another. When they, when they tolerate one another, it shows the love that they have for one another. We as spouses have to overlook, overlook a lot from one another. Amen. Say amen. Come on. That's exactly right. But we love one another because we, because we made a promise to God. But we prove our love to one another. Think about the best gift that you ever received. Now, let's not... I know some of you are going to say, oh, the greatest gift I got was Jesus Christ. And, and you would be right saying that. But I, I want us to go beyond or go just step aside from the spiritual for a minute and go to the material. Think about the great, a great gift that you received in your past. Maybe you received an automobile free of charge by somebody. Maybe you received a house. Maybe you inherited, uh, you know, a bunch of money or a bunch of property or something. Those are great gifts. Would you say amen to that? Those are, those are good gifts. Maybe somebody gave you something of great value to you. Why did they do that? It's because they loved you or love you and care about you. Right? When you receive something from somebody as a gift, it's, that's exactly what it is. It's a gift. We receive gifts not because we deserve it. We receive gifts because somebody loves us and wants to give us a gift. That's why, that's the way you should be thinking. You should never think, well, I deserve this gift. You don't really, you don't deserve anything, really. <laughs> Somebody gives you a gift because they love you and care about you. Birthday time, Christmas, whenever, you know, anniversary. You give gifts because you love one another. And so this demonstration of love is that he gave his only begotten son. This is God the Father sacrificing his son for the world. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, you know the verse, many of you know it, but if you don't, look at it. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Is that what it says? It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Ladies and gentlemen, salvation is a gift. A gift you don't have to do anything for. A gift you don't have to, you don't have to buy it. It's a gift. If you receive a gift from somebody, it's exactly what it is, is a gift. And I would hope and pray if you ever have given a gift... You don't ever expect to have that gift given back to you, do you? When you give a gift at Christmas time or birthday or whatever, and you give a gift to somebody and they unwrap it, that's their gift. You gave that gift to them. You're not going to give it to them and then 10 minutes later say, oh, by the way, I want that back. <laughs> I've never heard of that. Maybe you've done that. Maybe. I don't know. No. Even when you get mad at somebody, it's still a gift. Even when you're upset with somebody, it's still a gift. Even when that person doesn't ever talk to you anymore, it's still a gift. Think about the gift of salvation. How many people have been saved over the years and then just stopped talking to God, the, gift, the great gift giver? He doesn't take the gift back. You still got the free gift of salvation, and it's yours for eternity. I know lots of Christians that are saved, but they don't go to church. They don't do anything at all for God. And yet he still gave him a gift of salvation. And he's not going around saying, oh, by the way, I'm going to take that gift back again. You don't find that in the Bible anywhere where he's going to take salvation back. Once you're saved, you're saved forever. Yeah. Forever. Yeah. Never can, you can't, you might, people say, but what if I sin? You're still saved. You're just a saved sinner. But you can also go to God immediately and ask for forgiveness of that sin. And he can cleanse you of it. I'm going to give, uh, I really like this pen. It's one of my favorite pens. I'm a blue ink guy. How many of you are blue ink people? I love blue ink. 
and I look for blue ink pens. And I got this in the mail, free. I got it in the mail the other day. It's got the name of the church on it. First thing I do is I try it and see what color ink it is. If it's black, I just eh, put it over. It was blue. And so now I carry it with me. It's a very special pen. It's got little grippers on there. It's got this little thing on the end where I can, you know, do my phone or my tablet. It's really special. But I'm going to give it to you. Just for a little while. <laughs> Take it back after the service. Sure enough. But for illustration purposes, oh, it's tough. Come on now. You know what? It's just a pen, right? It's just a pen that writes blue ink. It's one of my favorites. But here you go. Now, just pretend, okay? Pretend you don't want it. Pretend you don't want it. No, 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 no. You just stand there. Okay, Kurt, I'm going to give you this. This is a great pen. This is worth $100,000. It's a great pen. It's got gold inside. It's a special pen, and it belongs to me, but I'm going to give it to you. Okay? Yes. This is for illustration purposes. Just stand there and be quiet for a minute, okay? Just stand there. Just stand there. Yeah, just like you are. Don't move. Don't move, okay? So... I'm going to offer him this gift. It's up to him to receive it, right? Yes. If he stands there like this, like he's doing, like I instructed him to do, and he doesn't take it, there's nothing that I can do. I can't force it on him. I mean, I could. I could try to stick it in his ear or something like that, you know, <laughs> stick it in his mouth. But if he doesn't want it, what can he do? Right? Yep. Nothing he can do. Nothing I can do as the gift giver. If he doesn't want it, okay, it goes back into my pocket. Now, play along, okay? But if he wants the gift, what does he have to do? Reach out, and he has to take it. Now that gift is, it's his. Sit down. You can sit down with the gift. She just took it from you. Wanted that, huh? You like blue? You just blew the whole illustration, but that's fine. But you get you get the picture. Do you understand? If he doesn't want it, he stands there and says, "I don't want it." How many people today are offered the gift of salvation, Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, and they say, "Nope, don't want it." My church is good enough. My 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 whatever it is, I'm good enough. I'm good enough. I think I'll get to heaven someday when I die. No, you're not. That gift is being offered, and then if you don't take it, and it's not the gift giver's fault. It's not God's fault. If you reject Jesus Christ and die and go to hell someday, it is not God's fault. You'll never be able to get to heaven someday and shake your fist at God and say, but I never knew, and... No, God's going to bring back to your memory a time you were in a service and you heard the truth. Somebody gave you a gospel tract. Somebody invited you to church. Somebody did something to try to point you to Jesus Christ. And if you reject, that is your fault. And you'll die and go to hell someday and spend eternity in hell because you rejected the gift. But if you reach out and take the gift, as Kirk did with my pen, that's his pen. You really can have that if you want it. But your illustration is this. Whenever I get a gift, the wife takes it. <laughs> I saw that. It's sitting right there. She grabbed it immediately and put it over there. So you got to really pray for Kirk because he doesn't get any gifts anyway. <laughs> Brenda gets them all. Do you see what, we're, you see what I'm trying to say? Second... Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 15 says, Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God the Father was willing to sacrifice His only Son for you and for me. Think about that. Let that resonate in your mind a little bit. 
This gentleman, I have his name written down in my notes, but I can't say it because I don't know if he's still trying to do this in China or not, so I'm not going to mention his name, but he, this gentleman speaks of a meeting. He meets a Chinese couple in Hong Kong while traveling in China. This gentleman says, and I quote, a friend took me down a narrow alley to a second floor flat to meet a man recently released from prison in China. I knew I would be pressured or pressed to carry Bibles and literature on my trip, but I was hesitant and tried to mask my fear with rationalizations about legalities and other concerns. A Chinese man in his 60s opened a door and his smile was radiant, but his back was bent almost double. He led us to a sparsely furnished room. A Chinese woman of, of about the same age, about 60, came in to serve us tea. And as she lingered, I could not help but notice how they touched and lovingly looked at each other like Steve and Barb. I just added that to him. <laughs> My sp uh, staring apparently didn't go unnoticed, for soon they were both giggling. What is it, I asked my friend. Oh, nothing, he said with a smile. They just wanted you to know that it was okay because they're newlyweds. I learned that they were engaged in 1949 when he was a student at Nan King Seminary. On the day before they were to be wedded, on their wedding rehearsal day, Chinese communists seized the seminary they took the students to a hard labor prison. For the next 30 years, the bride-to-be was allowed only one visit per year to her husband-to-be. Once a year, she was allowed to go and see him for a very short amount of time. Each time, following their brief minutes together, the man would be called to the warden's office, and the warden said this, and I quote, You may go home with your bride, he said, if you'll just renounce Christianity. Year after year, this, this man did this and replied for 30 years with the same one word, No. I was stunned, the man said. How could he have been able to stand the strain for so long, being denied his family, his marriage, and even his health? When I asked, he seemed astonished, the Chinese man was astonished at my question. He re replied this, and I quote, With all that Jesus has done for me, how could I betray him? Amen. With all that Jesus has done for you, how can you say no to him? How can you betray him? And listen, when you say no to him, when he's offering you the gift of salvation, you are rejecting him. You are neglecting him. And he's never neglected you. He's never forgotten you. He's always been there for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The degree of love and the demonstration of love is beyond what you and I can comprehend. I don't have time to finish this this morning. I'll finish the message and give you the other two points tonight of this verse. Folks, let me just ask you one question. Are you saved today? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Was there a time in your life that you personally believed upon Jesus Christ, and asked Him to save you? Was there a time in your life that you said to Jesus Christ, I am sorry for my sin. I repent of my sin. And Lord Jesus Christ, I believe you died for me on the cross. I believe that you rose again after three days and three nights. And Lord Jesus, I want the gift of eternal life. I want eternal life. I want to be saved. I want to go to heaven someday when I die. Was there a time in your life that you actually said that and did that? I hope there was. If not, you can get saved today. Jesus Christ is alive and well in heaven. And he wants to save your soul if you're not saved. Christian, he wants you to serve him. 
How is your service to the Lord? He did so much for you on that cross. He died for you, and you at one time, you said yes to God. You said yes to the Lord, and you got saved, right? How are you serving Him? What are you doing for Him? I hope and pray that you realize the importance of serving Jesus Christ after you get saved. I hope you really realize the importance of service. But number one, make sure that you realize the importance of salvation. If you're not saved, get saved today. We're going to have an invitation in a moment. It's simply we invite people to come to the altar. We invite you to trust Christ as your Lord and Savior. We want to show you. We want to help you. We just want to be a tool to show you how you can be saved. And I want all you Christians in this room to be praying, number one. Number two, I want all you Christians in here to be thinking about are you willing to serve the Lord like He served you? Father, thank you again for allowing us to be here today. It's by your will that we are all here. It's by your will that you had me bring this message today. Father, I pray that you would work mightily upon every single heart that's here. You know who's saved. You know who isn't. You know who needs to get saved today. And Father, I pray that you would just work in those hearts or heart. Father, I also pray that you would make us realize as Christians how much love you had for us and that you saved us. And now, Lord, our job is to serve you. Father, bless the invitation. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. Let's stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. No one looking around. <clears throat> we don't ever want to embarrass anybody. We just want you to know that you can be saved. We've had one come for salvation today. Blessing. Anyone else need to come and get saved today? Are you 100% sure that you're going to heaven someday? 100%. You can't be 99. Sure, you can't be 85 or 75 or I think I'm 50% sure. No, that doesn't work. Maybe you've been saved recently or sometime in the past and you've never surrendered for baptism. That's something you need to do too. The Bible teaches that after salvation comes baptism. Baptism is just a picture of what Christ has done for us and what you have done by accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior. Baptism brings you into the membership of our church. If you've never been scripturally baptized, that's something that you need to talk to me about. Maybe you've been attending here for a while, you've been saved, you've been scripturally baptized, but just you don't belong to a church. We would encourage you to come and join our church. 